Well, good morning, Love of Christ Church. How are you guys this morning? It is so good to be here with you, to see all of you. And, and what I would like to do right now, and I want us to get kind of accustomed to this, we have people who are all over the world who are watching online, and we want to welcome all of those who are online. We also have our Middletown campus with us. And so what I want to do right here from uh, Bear, Delaware, I want us to all stand to our feet. I want us to turn towards the camera, and I want us to welcome with great hospitality everybody who is watching. We love you guys. Thank you. Come on, give them a shout. Give them a hello. Thank you guys for being with us online, out in the atrium, at the Middletown campus, and wherever else in the world you are. You guys can be seated, but thank you for being welcoming. We are love of Christ Church, correct? And so we, we need to show some love. Well, it is an honor for me to be here with you uh, today. This is uh, my first message uh, as pastor here at Love of Christ Church, and I know... Well, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I, I know we have an ordination service coming, and Pastor uh, Steve is really uh, operating like Yoda and showing me the ways, and uh, with, all, with all of that wisdom and, and uh, grace and patience. So um, it, it's, a, it's a big day. It's a significant Sunday. I know for the Pearsons, that's how um, we feel. And, you know, the first time you do anything is typically pretty significant, and we think about the first time that we've done things or taken risks in our lives. And even if you drive around and you see the license plates and they say, the first state, right? Why? Because there's something special about the first. There's something significant about the first. And so I felt that way with, with this message. And there's even biblical symbolism. If you think about it in the Bible, the idea of first. Uh, there's something called first fruits in the Bible, and it's a picture of the tithe. But what's interesting, that word tithe means tenth, and yes, we're, as a believer, we're supposed to give God a tenth of our income, but did you know it's the first tenth? Because if you give God what is first, it takes faith, it takes trust, it takes belief. So there, there's an idea of first. How about the idea of firstborn? Pharaoh wouldn't let God's people go until God dealt with the firstborn. Even in Hebrew custom, the firstborn was um, to be given two-thirds of the inheritance. Now, I'm the oldest of five brothers, so I keep on reminding my brothers, you know, we believe in the Bible, so <laughs> they don't find that funny. Uh, but, but there's an, a, a picture of first. How about the first day of the week? Even in the Jewish calendar, Sunday is the first day of the week. You thought, you thought tomorrow is the first day of the week? No, biblically, today is the first day of the week, and you're starting your day off right being in God's house. Amen? So first, this idea first. So today is a significant Sunday, and you know, the question is, what do you do preaching your first message? Like, where, there's 66 books of the Bible. Which one? Which verse? Like, Help me out here, Lord. And I, I feel like a, a, a couple months ago, God dropped this passage into my heart. So we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 1. And you can uh, go ahead and camp out there for just a moment and we'll begin to read. But um, I really felt uh, just a settling in my heart that this was the passage that we were supposed to cover and that God had something to say today through this verse, through this passage. And my belief and my hope is, is that God is going to speak something that is going to hit differently. Amen? Can we be in agreement over that? So open your Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 1. And let's follow along. It says, these are the commands, the decrees, and the laws of the Lord your God. It's personal, your God directed to me to teach you to observe in the land you are crossing into the Jordan to possess. What I want you to see is there's a crossing over taking place. There is a transition taking place. They're moving from one piece of real estate to another piece of real estate. And they're crossing over. 
so that you and your children and their children after them, not just your kids, but your grandkids, may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands that I give you, so that you may enjoy long life. Couple things, God wants you to live a long life. He wants you to live long. He wants you to live strong. And it's interesting that that word enjoy is in there. I know that there's trials. I know that there's tests. I know that there's temptations. But we can enjoy the life that God has given us. Hear Israel and be careful to obey that it may go well with you. If you want it to go well with you, we have to obey. But we also have to know that God wants it to go well with us. And that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. There weren't M&Ms back then, so honey was the closest thing to like sugar. So imagine Froyo or whatever you're your sugar of choice is, just as the Lord your God, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. If you look at that word, it literally means your emotions, your feels, that deep part of you. Love the Lord with all of your emotion, all of your heart, with all of your soul. And that does speak to emotions, but it also speaks to your thought life. It speaks to your mind. Like, we need to think on things above. Isn't that what the New Testament tells us to do? We've got to think on right things. We've got, we've got to get our, take our thoughts captive and take them into captivity if they don't line up with the character and nature of God. So love God with all of your emotions, love God with all of your mind, your mental capacities, and love God with all of your strength. That word's interesting, strength there, because it's not just talking about your CrossFit acumen, Okay. What, what it's talking about, you guys will get that around lunchtime. Uh, what it's talking about is it's talking about abundance and muchness. In other words, God wants you to love him with every part of who you are, with everything good that you have. That's how we're supposed to love God. Verse six, these commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts and you're to impress them on your children. Now, you can't give away something that you haven't gotten yet. That's like trying to write a check and cash it if there ain't any money in the account. Now, now some of you are too young to know what a check is. It's a piece of paper. It's perforated. You write on it, and, and, and maybe there might be some money in the bank backing what you write. Um, but that's the equivalent if you don't have it yourself, if you don't understand it yourself, if you haven't ingested it yourself, you can't give it away to the next generation. So it's imperative that we get it so that we can give it, right? Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, when you get up. That's pretty much all the time because we're either walking or we're lying down in bed. And so whenever it is, we're supposed to have God's commands written, his word written on our hearts. It's symbols on your hands and bind them to your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you the land with large flourishing cities you did not build. Here's where I want us to dial in for just a moment. Large flourishing cities that you did not build build houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide wells you did not dig and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant then when you eat and are satisfied be careful that you do not forget the lord who brought you out of egypt out of the land of slavery there's so much here that we could talk about, but I want us to dial in for just a moment because I think this passage right here is significant and timely for our church and for the season that we're in as a church. One of the things that theologians say is they say uh, this passage in Deuteronomy 6 is really a, in fact, the whole book is really talking about transition because Moses 
and Joshua and Caleb are now taking the next generation that was born in the wilderness, not into slavery. All they've known is tents and all they've known is nomadic living. And now they're reestablishing the promises and the word of God with that next generation. They're telling the next generation that before they pursue the promised land, which is a picture of a promised life to a New Testament believer, that they have to pursue God, that they have to get his commands right, that they have to pray and obey. So this is a significant passage. It's talking about generations. It's talking about leaving the nomadic life, the wilderness, the desert, and coming into a place of promise and provision. It's coming into a new life. It's no longer being in tents, but houses. Let me say it this way. It's no longer renting, but owning. Uh, It's talking about no longer eating manna, just flaky carbs, but milk and honey. No longer being temporary, but being permanent. And the truth is, Our church, Love of Christ Church, is going through a similar transition. In some ways, we're at a crossroads, just like they had to cross over the Jordan. There's a crossroads for us. And the crossroads is we're we're moving from our legacy and into our destiny. We're at the crossroads of legacy because these two have laid a legacy for this church. And now... We're stepping into a new day and a new promise and stepping in to destiny. Thank you guys for leaving and laying legacy. Amen? And what I love about God is he's so faithful. He doesn't just tell us what to do. He tells us how to do, right? Have you you ever had maybe a boss in your life who would tell you what to do, but they would never tell you how to do? to accomplish it, right? And I love that God's word is so good that it tells us exactly how to do it because here's what this passage speaks to. It it tells us how to carry ourselves in a new season. If you know you're in transition, you've got to carry yourself differently. I I have a a pastor friend and uh, in the the early 80s, he was hired on uh, to be a uh, associate pastor at a massive church in Atlanta. And back then, all the pastoral staff sat in like big oversized chairs. It was a thing. Like, okay, you wore some of you, like I remember 90s grunge. It was a thing. Don't judge me. Anyways, but he was up there and uh, afterwards his uh, pastor said, are those your only pair of dress shoes? And uh, he said, yeah, why? He goes, I need you to get some new shoes. He goes, if you can't afford them, I'll buy them for you. And he was, he was, my pastor friend was kind of shocked. And he said, he said, why? He goes, new platform, new shoes. New platform, new shoes. When God takes you into a new season, you need to learn how to operate appropriately. When God takes you into a new place, you can't, it's not business as usual. It's not the way you've always done it. It's not the method you've always had. When God takes you into a new place, you do it differently. So the word tells us how to carry ourselves in a new season, how to develop our relationship with God. It even tells us how to raise kids. Can I get a hallelujah up in here? Uh, It tells us how to safeguard your spiritual life. It tells us how to steward the blessings that are moving in your direction. Usually, when you read commentaries, when you study these verses out, a lot of times it'll just focus on like the first nine verses. It'll talk about, hey, you need to obey and you need to understand what, the commands of God and you need to get it right. And all those things are true. However, I want to flip the coin and I want to pose this question. What do you do when the promise comes? Because that's where Israel was at. And Israel is all, it's an Old Testament type and shadow of the New Testament church. So it's not a bunch of ancient people in history that doesn't apply. It applies to us today in 2022 as much as it ever has. So what do you do when the promise comes? Because the Bible says that all the promises of God are yes and amen. 
So I want you to relook at this list for just a second. It says that he's going to give you cities that you didn't build. Let me say it this way. No cost, no construction. That's pretty good, right? He's going to give you houses that are fully furnished. It literally says good things. When I think about that, that corresponds with the New Testament in the book of James, where it says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no uh, variableness or shadow of turning. In other words, God's not going to change his mind. God's not going to dangle a carrot. God's not going to say, I love you. I love you. I love you not. That's not how God operates. If he makes a promise, he'll keep the promise. So every good and perfect gift, there will be houses with good things. Sometimes we don't think we're worthy of good things. No, you're not worthy because of you. You're worthy because of him. So receive what he's trying to give you. It says that there will be wells that you didn't dig. We're going to come back full circle to that in just a moment, and we'll close with that thought. And then it says that he'll give you olive groves and vineyards which means food and drink. Before you get too excited about the idea of vineyards, remember back then, water had all kinds of parasites. It was a good way to get dysentery was to drink surface water. So one of the things they did in ancient times is they would drink wine because it could be fermented and it didn't have as much potential to make you sick. And so this is a picture of provision. It's food and drink and God meeting our most basic of all needs. Now, for just a split second, you could read this passage and you could go, hmm, there's a little bit of entitlement there that God's going to give me what I didn't work for, that he's going to give me blessings that somebody else sweated for, and I'm going to be the beneficiary of those blessings. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that sure sounds like New Testament grace. Mm, We'll come back there in just a second. So, Here's what I believe. There is a kingdom cause and effect. In science, you have cause and effect. It's, it's causation. If you, if you do something, it puts something else into motion. It puts something else into play. And the whole first part of that chapter is focusing on kingdom cause and effect. It's saying learn God's commands, learn God's character, and know God's conditions. Right? Right? cause and effect. And then if we'll do those things, if we'll understand God and get to know God, then the blessing comes. So when we focus on God, when we move in his direction, when we get passionate about what he's passionate about, then, then it will come to pass and the promise will be fulfilled, which is simply, the picture of it is James chapter four and verse eight. If we'll draw near to God, he'll draw near to us. We have to move first in his direction, but because he's unlimited, he will move equally and even greater in our direction. It's cause and effect in the kingdom. So we need to understand that our God is a generous father, that all the promises in him are yes and amen. That he said, if we ever lack wisdom, all we've got to do is ask, and he'll give it to us liberally. That he has the gift of the Holy Spirit that he wants to give to us. So how do you avoid, if God wants to give us the blessings, if he wants us to, I'm going to go out there on a limb, prosper, which is actually a biblical term. Like, how do we, how do we prosper without falling into the pitfalls of pride that prosperity can cause? Great question. Thank you for asking. So 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I wish that you would prosper and be in health. But there's a condition to it. Even as your soul prospers. Your bank account can prosper, but if your soul isn't prospering, you've got a bag with holes in it. Like it's going to come apart on you. Because there's something that happens when we begin to prosper internally, when we get God's character and nature on the inside of us, when we get our soul and our thoughts and our emotions into alignment with God and his word, then you'll see an external blessing begin to manifest out beyond us. 
So if you want the blessing and you want the prosperity, it, but you don't want it to make you entitled, to make you complacent, or to make you indifferent, you've got to do it his way. So how do you manage the prosperity without producing pride? How do you stay balanced when you do receive the blessing? Because that's where Israel was at. I'm going to give you three ways. Number one is this, stay close to God. What did it say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest of commandments? That was his answer. He was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6. But then he took it to another level, and he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And then I love how Jesus, like sometimes I think he was just like, like having fun, playing with us. This is how I see it in my mind. Because he says, love your neighbors yourself. And then he tells this story about a Samaritan who, who the Jews were racist against the Samaritans because they were considered half-breeds. And then he makes the Samaritan the hero of the story, the good Samaritan. And then he defines the Samaritan as the neighbor. So what is Jesus saying? Love everybody. Not, not everybody. Let Put a little mm on it. Everybody, right? That's what... Jesus wants us to do. So we have to stay close to God. Keep his commandments on your heart and in your home. What did it say? Write it on the door frames. I had a friend, we went over to his house for dinner and as he was showing us around the house, he took us to the second story and then he took us through this, this, this little hole into the attic where he had Sharpies for us. And he asked me and Cheyenne and our kids to write scriptures and encouraging words on the wall. What was he doing? He was writing God's word literally on the doorposts, or you can say the sheetrock. That's what we're supposed to do. Keep God's word in front of us. So number one is stay close to God. Number two, you have to remember where you came from. When we remember where we came from, it creates humility. The Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I don't want to be stiff-armed by God. I want to operate in humility because I need grace. I need his grace operating in my life. See, when this was spoken, he was speaking to Israel after 400 plus years years of slavery. Israel was slaves longer than America has been a nation. Think about that for just a second. But here's the thing about slavery. Slavery is a symbolism of sin and the attachments of sin. It's a picture of being bound with chains of sin and shame. So when it says that God took Old Testament Israel and brought them out of slavery. It's a picture in the New Testament of Jesus picking us up, breaking the chains off of us, and setting us free. And you know what happens? You come into church and you meet Jesus and you get saved and you get reborn and everything's new and it's amazing. And then you've been in it for a minute and you've attended a small group and you're on a serve team and now all of a sudden you know the difference between John the Beloved and John the Baptist. And you think you've arrived and you think you're the next theologian and you can write your own commentaries and stuff. What happens? Paul said knowledge puffs up. So we have to choose to keep ourselves in a place of humility because a humble person can learn anything from anybody at any time. So it would serve you well to remember who you were B.C., before Christ. Number three, you've got to give it away. Jesus said, freely you've received, so freely you've got to give. There's a biblical mandate to pay it forward. When me and Cheyenne uh, uh, were for, right before we got married, we didn't, <laughs> we were in Bible college, we didn't have two nickels to rub together. Like, <laughs> eating at Chili's was being bougie, like back in those days. And uh, so, so we, and, and we didn't really get support from our families. And so we don't got two nickels to rub together. The pastor who married us, Pastor John, him and his wife, Miss Ann, just, they just loved us. 
They co-signed on furniture for us. We asked somebody else and they said, well, the Bible says, no, oh man, oh, no man but to, to love them. So we don't feel like we can co-sign for you. It's like, oh, but these guys loved us so much. They took a risk on us. There were so many times they would pay for our meals. So many times that uh, he'd give me opportunities. He would send me out on weekends to go preach at churches. Let me preach in his own church. And Pastor John uh, passed away a little over a year ago. And uh, I still remember he did all of these things for us, blessed us in so many ways. And there's no way to say thank you when somebody does stuff like that. Like, how do you, uh, how do you say thank you and appreciate somebody who's blessed you in that way? But he made me give him a promise. He said, when you're in this position someday and you can, I want you to bless somebody else. So there's been so many times... <laughs> The guy rapping on the street corner yesterday in Philly went and threw a $20 bill in, in the bucket, and then he works me into his rap somehow. Why, why? Why that generosity? Because I made a promise to somebody that as I was blessed, I would turn around and bless others. There's three stages, and maybe I'll unpack them at a different time, but there's, there's three stages in our life. There's a learning stage. Some people never pass from the learning stage. There's an earning stage, and then there's a returning stage. See, we've got to learn how to plant trees for future generations to rest in the shade of. Let me give you a quote. What is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you'll never get to see. That was brought to you by the great theologian Hamilton, the Broadway show. <laughs> But I want to focus, I said we would close with this, I want to focus on the idea of wells. It says that they would dig wells. Now, it's very important that you understand biblical context and biblical symbolism. In 2022, we can't, we, we don't understand digging wells. If I want water, I go turn on the faucet, like, that's, if, if, if I want water, I have plenty of access to water. You want the hose outside, you want the, the, the sink, you want the shower, you want the tub. We got water coming everywhere. But in that time, there wasn't access to water. And water is critical to life. In the Middle Eastern desert, where this book was written, water was a necessity. Water was a limited resource. Water was hard to come by. And if there wasn't water, it was critical to life and you could die. Your body is made up of 70% of water, as you already know. So wells were important. Wells were significant. And not only did wells have incredible natural connotations to them, but they had spiritual symbolism as well. Think about John chapter 4. Jesus meets a woman at a well. It wasn't coincidence that Jesus sent the disciples off to get food. He knew there was a thirsty woman coming to the well. And so this thirsty woman comes and he says, you can keep on walking out here and filling up this pot trying to get some water because you're thirsty. Or you can tap into the well that never runs dry. You can find the one who is the living water. And she said, give me the water. Jesus is the living water. So wells are important. They represent life. They represent provision. They even represent salvation. And God here in Deuteronomy 6 is promising his people that he will dig well or give them wells that have already been dug. Digging in the, in the Middle Eastern dirt a well? That must have been a daunting task. It's, it's not like you could go to Lowe's and just buy a shovel. There was no modern machinery. Dirt was hard and dirt was dry. And there was no guarantee that wherever you were digging was going to produce water. You could dig until you hit China and, and you might not hit water. 
Imagine going to all that energy and all that effort and still being thirsty. And even if there was a well, enemies would try to come and stop it up. Abraham's Abraham's enemies did the same thing. So wells were important in that context and in that time, but they're still important today. We've got to find the well that doesn't run dry. I want to show you something and try to, try to bring this point home. Try to, try to make it hit. And so today, I want you to bear with me. I want you to pretend that this is our well. And we want to dig a well. Imagine, I, I don't know what kind of tools they had for well digging back then. I just know there was no lows that existed at that time. So maybe, maybe it's like using a spade. Any, anybody ever used a spade? This is good if you've got like dandelions in your flower beds, right? That's about the use. So imagine digging a well with that. It, it's, it's not going to go real well. It would take an eternity. It would take a lifetime to dig a well. Well, let's upgrade. How many of you have ever used one of these? How many of you have ever used one of these because it was a punishment? Come on, your parents were legit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, re- I still remember a time, hey, you get to go over to grandma and grandpa's house for the weekend and hang out with grandma and grandpa. Pfft. Grandpa had an ulterior motive. He had one of these in hand and a young back, yeah. And, and the, the truth is, you can, you can get a little way with one of these. Now, you're going to get some calluses on your hands. But anybody know what I'm talking about? You can get in, uh, and, uh, and, and, and you can dig, and you could dig a well. And, you know, it's more for post holes, but you could g- dig a well eventually. And what I want you to see is this is a picture of us doing it in our own strength. This, this is a little better this is a picture of us really grinding. How many of you ever had a season of like grinding? Like you're, you're using the elbow grease and everything. Like you're putting your back into it. You're making it work. You're, you're, you're getting up early, going to bed late, doing whatever it takes. Yeah, you're grinding, right? And, and, and this works to some degree, but it's not going to dig the well that you want. Well, sometimes there's a different way. This is called partnership with Holy Spirit. How many of you know we're supposed to work smarter and not? (laughs) Partnering with Holy Spirit and doing it his way, not your way, is working smarter and not harder. So imagine if they needed to dig a well, but they had this bad boy and they could just. Doesn't take long, does it? So let's partner with Holy Spirit. Let's do it God's way and not our way. It's his power and not ours. That's a picture of New Testament grace. It's by grace through faith. Faith is our part. Faith is believing and trusting. But he's the one who is doing the heavy lifting it's his grace, it's, it's, and grace isn't just unmerited favor, it's empowerment. It's tapping into a power source that is greater than our own. This is a picture of grace. It's New Testament grace working in our lives. It's what salvation is, just like a well represented salvation because it gave living water so you can live in a desert. We can't live without the grace of God. It is salvation. And the truth is, we didn't earn it. We, don't, we certainly don't deserve it. We can't get it ourselves, and yet he gives it freely anyways. We need his grace today. In Middletown, we need his grace today. Online, we need his grace today. What I want you to see is is just like we dug a well. 
Pastor Steve and Pastor Barbara have dug great wells spiritually. Remember I said there's a connection, a correlation between this passage and the season that Israel was in and the season that we find ourselves in. Pastor Steve and Barbara have dug deep wells spiritually. I was, I was out in the, the, the atrium right after first service and somebody came up to me and they said, we've been here 12 years. Here's what I want you to know. It is uncommon for a church to have so many people who have been a part of that church for years and years and decades and decades. That's faithfulness. Isn't that one of the names of Jesus? That he would be called faithful and true? These two have dug wells. And so I get to be the beneficiary of a house I didn't build. Filled with good things. Good things. Good things. And there's living water to be found. I'm thankful for those of you who have been a part of this church for years. And I'm excited for those of you who are just new on the journey, who are just getting started with us. There are so many of you who have been builders. You built the houses. You've dug the wells. You paid the price. You have the calluses to prove it. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your serving. Thank you for your giving, your generosity, your faithfulness. You're showing up on a Saturday and doing an outreach for the homeless on the days that you felt like it and on the days you didn't feel like it. I'm in a season of amazing thankfulness and humility because there's been a price that's been paid and there's been a well that's been dug. And because that well has been dug, there's water to draw from. And just like God's people in Deuteronomy, we're at the dawn of a new day and in a new season, and it was time for them to inherit the land. We are at a crossing over point. Middletown, we are at a crossing over point. We get to cross over into a new land in a new time. But we remember the legacy. We remember that somebody else dug the wells. And you might have been here 20 years, 30 years. Somebody new is going to get to come in and they're going to get to start where you are today. They're going to get to stand on your shoulders because you were willing to dig. Amen. Before I pray, I want to go ahead and uh, turn over uh, to the Middletown campus. Uh, Pastor Curtis is going to uh, lead you guys in prayer and, and uh, just share with you what's on his heart. But we love you guys. We appreciate you. All those who are online, my, my, my Cajun friends uh, who have been watching today, we love you guys. And uh, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank God. Here's what I really am thankful for. That way more than the words I had to say, you were speaking. And you might have been speaking to one about marriage and you might have been speaking to another about starting a business and you might have been speaking to one that they don't have to live in depression anymore. But God, you were speaking. And Lord, my prayer is that every time I preach, that greater than the words that are coming out of my mouth are the words that you're breathing through your Holy Spirit. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen.